Hello, welcome adventurers to the third episode of The Travel Log, a podcast in which I, Stephen Hoffert, my pronouns are he, him, and Lily Lavin, she, her, will be diving into the world of Faerun from the Dungeons and Dragons tabletop role-playing game. We will go area by area, town by town, to provide a background of canonical lore, as well as suggestions on what type of encounters you could run there, or what type of character you could create whose background is based there. Last week, we dived into an overview of Nonthal, Centaur Bridge, among others. And today, we'll be visiting the westmost area, Gilded Glade and Yorn. There's also a whole mess of areas in between with no lore that Lily and I will improv lore for. I'll use some mythology and history prompts if we get stuck. Lily, what real world mythology do you know the most about? I mean, at this point, probably d and I mean, I know it's not real. I know it's not real world, but like... That's not real world. I don't know. That, okay. That, yeah, that if, doesn't count. <laughs> in 10,000 years, people find books under a thing about a pantheon of gods. They're going to be thinking that the Faron Pantheon was actually worshipped by a group of people over Zoom. <laughs> I got a huge encyclopedia today of mythology and like it, it has Slavic and uh, Euro, Fallofian, like you, you just like a big point form encyclopedia, but I'm really excited to crack into that. That's pretty cool. Point form sounds like it'd be nice. I mean, then to answer the actual question, probably Catholic and Christian mythology, just because I grew up in the church. Otherwise, Greek, just because everyone knows Greek mythology, and I just played... Right, that makes sense. Whatever the game is. Hades? Yeah, and I just played Hades, so that just upped it a little bit too, but so to that, what about you? I, I got into, like, I grew up Christian, but I didn't really get into the lore aspects of it too much. You got the Bible verses, but I recently got really into, like, learning about the different angels and kind of different creatures you don't think of christianity as a creature filled mythology but there's there's creatures there's demons there's angels yeah i mean there's not only demons and devils and shit but there's like i don't know even just that famous tale you know the whale even like even that big fish is a, a creature a mythological creature there's also what is it like the three-headed dragon right yeah at yeah, the end there's also a bunch of stuff like not in christian but in catholic and i guess getting the word like jewish lore in you know, non-canonical or non-deuteronomical texts about, I don't know, all sorts of creatures. Like, you know, like the Key of Solomon and everything. That's all Christianity lore. There's some fun stuff in there, honestly. And Solomon was like, I don't know, writing books about how to summon demons <laughs> and <laughs> princes of hell to like do shit for you and stuff. And so he just, yeah, I don't know. I think it's cool. Cool. We're going to keep those in mind. But first, we're going to go to Gilden Glade. I said Gilden Gale all last episode. It's Gilden Glade to warm up before the improv. The city is the second largest within Termish, composed of dwarves, elves, and half-elves living together in harmony. Its economy is based upon wood cutting and mining. Sounds like a cute Canadian town. Everyone's just resource extracting and like everyone's living in <laughs> harmony. It sounds nice, eh? Yeah, it sounds kind of nice. The dwarves, the elves hanging out together. It's, you don't hear that too much. No, they usually are a bit at arms, at least in most lore. I mean, you've got the dwarves to drink with and you've got the elves to be a bit pretentious with. <laughs> yeah, the dwarves drink and then the elves you go to like a dinner party with. You look at art. Gildenglade is ruled by elves of the community who handle all the negotiations with the Emerald Enclave. The elves are skilled enough in forestry and preservation that they probably have the best rapport with the Enclave of any city within the reef. The dwarf population of the city concentrates on mining the unusually pure veins of gold that honeycomb the earth below Gildenglade. The half-elves primarily serve as physical labor for the lumbering efforts, but they enjoy their work and are treated as equals by both the elves and dwarves of the community. Once it just keeps going, this place sounds like a utopia i thought it was going to be sketchy because it's like on the smuggler's road what they call the smuggler, smuggler's road it's the start of it to jathan's shop but i guess not yeah i mean i guess a lot of elves and dwarves like to just keep their shit together like they kind of just pick a place to live and go we don't care about anything else right so i mean i can imagine them if you were to go there and be like what do you think of jathan's jump they'd probably be like i don't care about that we care about what's in our... Right, that doesn't concern Yeah, I us. mean, it seems like they keep little communities and just only care about that, right? I feel like that, you know, there's maybe people of the written lore or like philosophy about that, but I feel like that might be necessary when you live so long. Like, it'd be hard to care about what was happening yeah. continents over if you live for 100 years. I mean, definitely. Also, I mean, it's lore that goes back forever, you know, even Elrond and the elves in Lord of the Rings where, I mean, everything with elves is kind of picking from Lord of the Rings, but even in Lord of the Rings, right, the elves kind of did their own thing and lived 
lived outside of main society until they were kind of forced to partake, right? Given the amount of wealth that Gildenglade has, it is not surprising that many tales concerning lost wealth have arisen over the years. A few have actually given credence by unfortunate happenstance. The most recent occurrence of a tale coming to life occurred when a visitor followed a ghostly image of a human phantom as it glided across the street with sacks of gold. It turned out to be a crimson death, and the tourist quickly became a meal for the ravenous beast. Since that time, other crimson deaths have been discovered roaming the area around Gildenglade. So I searched up crimson death. It's now called Vampiric Mists in Mordekonin's Tome of Foes. 3CR, drains life, can't go in sunlight, can't enter a home without permission. I love how... Yeah, it's like a vampire, but it's mist. Yeah, vampire mist. I love how they're cool as all hell. I must say I love the vampire mist. Terrifying. I love how it was a traveler that saw this for the first time, not some elf. Yeah, right? <laughs> like, how was this thing just chilling here until some outsider saw it? Like, I feel like it might become... Because it's going with sacks of gold and him as and it went towards it. Maybe it is something that the elves knew about. And they're like, yeah, well, obviously you don't go up to a weird pulsing red mist that has sacks of gold hanging from it that is dumb so a tourist is like oh whoa hey that's pretty cool let's go see what that that's about <laughs> <laughs> or or the elves are up to something they don't want tourists yeah that could be it. i wouldn't put past them pretty funny yeah true maybe they just hired some vampire mists there's some concern in the community that there's a sinister intelligence directing these mist creatures to violence others insist that the creatures are merely following their instinct and preying upon mortal greed within the city so there might be a mist or vampire out there. <laughs> I don't really know what makes a vampire mist. Is it when a vampire burps? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's explained in Mordekainen, which I have, but I have, I don't know. And I know vampires can turn into mist, but I don't think when vampires are mist, they are the vampiric mist. Right. It's something else. But yeah, I don't know. Something could control them or make them. Yeah, I don't know. That was all nice. Sounds like a beautiful place. Vampire mists, yeah, watch out for those. Here's the thing. In 4E, the volcano Mount Colimus in the center of the Apri Mountains erupted in 1423 DR. The city of Gildenglade, once home to nearly 5,000 people, was buried under hundreds of feet of volcanic mud and ash. Only a few hundred of its citizens managed to survive. The city was erased from the map. <laughs> Years later, after lava had cooled, caves opened up in the buried city. Bold adventurers dug down to find it eerily preserved and overrun with creatures from the underdark that beautiful happy utopia it's gone it's dead it's grim i find i, I did not play 4e and i find a lot of the writing in it so far is very much like everything sucks <laughs> it's the worst now it was written what in like the early 2000s that was kind of the vibe back then but yeah it's very grim dark like oh no <laughs> happiness yeah, I mean, I've never played it. I'm not sure, but I know 3E, third edition, was like crazy wild high magic. And even though I would still say fifth edition is high magic, it's we're playing in a lower magic setting, but it's still hard to have low magic with 5E rules if you want the full scope of the game. So I know they toned it down from third edition. I don't know if that started in fourth edition or not, but also maybe that goes hand in hand with, I know fourth edition was very superhero movie. I've heard, I've never played it, but I hear a lot of the complaints were that the tone and like the uh, rules and the mechanics of it were super, you are Iron Man. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so like even martial classes had special magic powers they could do once per long rest and stuff. Yeah, that was right around the time of Marvel just starting, and it, Marvel hadn't become very comic booky yet. It was still in that Christopher Nolan Batman dark yeah. geek stuff is now serious, and it's not your child's geek things. You know, like the whole geek culture was in this like miasma of taking itself too seriously. So yeah, I could see that. Yeah, plus it could be that they thought the grim, if everything is shitty, it's the perfect world to be a, a superhero in because there's so much stuff for you to fix with your amazing ultra powers. It's hard to imagine fourth edition being more superhero-y than D&D &D is inherently. Right. Like I'd be interested to play just to, to see how that comes because it's like by the time you're level 17, you're already like controlling the weather and hopping planes. How, how were people more more Marvel superhero action star than that. <laughs> I'm curious too, yeah. 40, this happened 50 years ago. As the timeline, the holes opened up 50 years ago and like people have been exploring. So I think we could say people 
come back. I think you can say that, especially because like the city is still there. The gold is still there. The dwarves probably came back. Whoever survived. Yeah, but I mean, the city's buried under v- lava. Like, sure, hardened. I'm not saying that the city is back to its normal. I'm saying that the people have come, people are in this area again. Like, Gilden Glade is a place that like people have come to either to dig up what is there or to just like, it, you know, there's still still apparently a forest nearby. There's still gold under the mountains. Yeah, true. And it's 50 years. Like the dwarves who were mining for the gold probably still, who didn't die from the volcano would still be around. I guess the creatures from the Underdark would put a bit of a, a wrench in that though. Yeah. I mean, if I were to have people go here, I definitely wouldn't have a city back. I would make it so that you were going there to fix it so that the dwarves can come back and get their gold. Right, right. If I were to run a quest here, that's it would be going in and essentially destroying everything that's in there so that the greedy dwarves can have their gold back. Maybe the, because the Emerald Enclave seemed to like this place. They liked the people who live there. Maybe the Emerald Enclave wants you to go there too and like take out the Underdark and restore the natural balance of the place. Yeah, also depending on where you are in a campaign when you get to this place, Another interesting thing you could do is that the villain has already done that. And now whoever your villain is at the time has this huge source of gold. Mm. And maybe he didn't even kill everything there. Maybe he was just like, yo, Underdark creatures, join me and we'll just emaciate everything in the na- in, in the neighborhood. And you're like, well, shit, we can't just let Velenor the Undying have a never ending source of gold to use to dominate the world. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a cool idea. It's a, it is a very accessible treasure if you know how to get it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I like that. And it could be like, you know, like step three on your five step adventure of stopping Velenor. Step three is destroy his gold mine. Yeah, you don't like, I don't know. I have not heard of a lot of campaigns and I've not played any where like the bad guy is like a politician or someone that like rules an area. <laughs> like, yeah, this is like this person runs a town. Bad, bad person, <laughs> but cool. Yeah. yeah, I I think so. This is a good time for us to look into the lore of the mountain that that erupted in the mountain side, uh, the mountain area near Gilden Glade, just so we have a better idea of what we're looking at. The Apru Mountains. These mountains have served as a shield of stone between the kingdom of Termish and many other small towns towns that have grown up along the shores of the Vilon. Like other mountain ranges, they have a power structure of their own among their inhabitants. Most travelers are familiar with Mount Colmis, called Eversmoke due to its volcanic activity. The city of Gildenglade is even more familiar with the volcano, wink wink. Ten years ago, the city was concerned that Eversmoke might eventually erupt and destroy their town. Wow. <laughs> well, want, it did. Well, it did. <laughs> with that in mind, they hired a wizard to research a spell that would silence the volcano forever. Denirio of Alagone stepped forward to conquer the mountain. For two years, Denirio researched a spell that would silence the volcano. On a hot summer day in 1360, he climbed up to the lip of Mount Columus and began casting his spell. Whether or not he would have been successful will never be known. Agents of the Emerald Enclave shapeshift on either side of him and pushed the spell casting mage into the heart of the volcano. Denirio's ring of featherfall was said to activate, but only served to offer him a slow death as he floated slowly down into the magma. <laughs> So that's brutal. <laughs> so yeah, the Emerald Enclave knew this was a was an issue. Knew that they were worried about. It. I, I it seems like they wanted it to happen. Denario's cottage and all of his research notes were destroyed in a fire that occurred just about the same time Denario's dip in the volcano. The facility of Gilden Glade received a warning from the Enclave not to meddle with forces it didn't understand, nor to try to hire those, nor to try to hire those who thought they did understand. Hence, Eversmoke continues to spew forth steam, but it has yet to erupt until 4E. I'm going to posit that the Enclave maybe didn't want everyone to die. I feel like they are, you know, natural order. I don't think they would want Gilden Glade to die, but I don't think they want want you to stop the volcano either because natural occurrence i feel like they would have helped the people of the town except for the fact that in the spell plague of 4e the emerald enclave lost most of its abilities yeah i mean how long after this they killed this guy did it erupt they killed him in 1360 and it erupted in 1423 so a good 63 years after yeah i mean that could be it i don't know maybe they just wanted the city to die you never but that seems so mean (laughs) yeah but i mean like they're a secretive faction of druids that think they're outside of the government just because you're lawful good i don't even know if they're lawful good the main deity of nature sylvanas is true neutral just because they're not the bad 
bad guys doesn't mean they haven't done bad things in the idea of their cause right right it's just i don't see how not letting the people know because i would assume they would have some sort of magic that told them or when the eruption happened that they would know i don't see why it would help them to not help the people or warn the people i mean maybe they wanted the people maybe they wanted the people to die maybe, maybe they were worried yeah maybe they weren't happy with the mining of the dwarves like they were happy with the elves but not not the dwarves yeah i mean it says earlier that the emerald on cave liked the elves didn't it yeah maybe that was all just a front yeah could be I, I like your idea of like yeah trying to either rebuild it or someone has rebuilt it for their own purposes this is why the lore is frustrating at times though because it's like i don't know this is contradictory to me what is why did they if they like the elves why did they not stop the eruption why did they kill this guy you know it's like they clearly wanted the eruption to happen and they clearly know something more like they say there, don't meddle with forces you don't understand, that kind of implies that they understand it. In which case, why didn't they warn people? Why aren't they telling people about it? And then the thing that frustrates me about reading the lore is that what is it like forces you don't understand what what does the um, they're miss like just tell us what the emerald enclave was hoping to achieve here even if what they were hoping yeah it, it would be nice yeah even if it was just expansion of nature happens mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know like you don't stop an eruption because we're supposed to have you know a balance between society and nature sometimes that balance includes nature being an asshole yeah, yeah, it doesn't let you know what they were trying to do if they were... I can get them not wanting a wizard to stop a volcano because the volcano is natural. It's naturally supposed to erupt, but I don't see in their tenants why a bunch of people dying serves them either and like why they wouldn't tell these elves they liked, like, hey, this volcano is pretty close to erupting. Maybe move, maybe get out of here. Exactly, but also at the other hand, like maybe the elves were the ones controlling these vampiric mists. We don't know. That's up for you to decide. Yeah, maybe... Yeah. Maybe the elves were evil. Maybe they wanted them dead. The Scything Claw Band of Kobolds also call a prune their home. This group makes infrequent raids into Termish, providing the roving militia with a focus for their attention. So you know the saying, where there's smoke, there's fire? Well, where there's kobolds, there's dragons. I looked it up, and in 3E it says, Frizzerfraz, <laughs> a young <laughs> adult gold dragon, is living there, and Heligalathar, a male great worm, red great worm. I don't know what a great worm is. Maybe it's the old term for ancient dragon. Yeah, I think so, because it's a highest CR. Those are the great worms. Right. So yeah, Hamaglathar, a red dragon, and Frizzenfraz, a gold dragon, were living in the hills. So interesting thing you could add there. Maybe the red dragon was living near the volcano. Maybe that had something to do with it. Emerald Enclave didn't want to mess with the dragon. Maybe they were uh, friends. But also the thing is, is that gold dragons are good and red dragons are bad. Mm -hmm. Right. So like maybe they there's some kind of tension between those two dragons. Yeah, I could see that. It's not a huge. It's a it's a big ish mountain range, but it's not huge. Like they see each other. Yeah, and I know they don't like sharing territories generally, especially red dragons. Right. So like maybe I don't know the eruption had something to do with that. Maybe even what we were talking about earlier. Like if your villain has come in and taken over the mountain, maybe the red dragon helped with that because he's like pissed off that there's a gold dragon there and he thinks this will run them out. Right. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. Dragon lore. More dragons. I'm sure they're dead now. Most dragons died during the Draco rage of what is that? Third edition, fourth edition. I don't know. Oh, I did not know that. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. Yeah. That's why they're not everywhere. Okay. Well, yeah. That makes sense. That uh, maybe those those two died then. Huh. That's that's gonna change some lore in places well it's up to you you get to choose once again it's not confirmed or denied that they died but if there was a big die off of dragons yeah maybe those those two have died off but uh their machinations brought upon some ruin earlier in some edition i forget which one it is um i don't even know fully what it is something called a draco rage happened where some curse spell anomaly happened that just made all the dragons go well into a barbarian rage and kill each other good bad they just were like time to die and that's why like you'll read lore and it'll be like this place is infested with dragons and then you'll read the next paragraph and it'll be like only one dragon lives here and it's like well what happened there and it's just this draco rage that none of the if you just go on the wiki they never talk about it right yeah 1373 it said the draco rage happened so 1373 it would have been probably 3e and that happened before the volcano erupted these dragons could be alive they could be dead i, I don't know yeah no i think if you don't want dragons to be in the hills you can add that this is kind of a mix and match this is kind of like a, a personalized sunday bar of lore where you're like maybe <laughs> i want the dragons maybe i don't yeah lily are you ready for some loreless places oh most of them are loreless places we're going to if you want to help you want to grab the termish map 
Okay, so we're going to start right from Gildenglade, moving over on the same road. Marybelle, what is it? One thing I was thinking of, I looked up Moroccan mythology. There's a kind of half camel, half person, satyr-like creature that would lead men to their deaths. And she would draw people's attention with kind of a bell-like shake. Maybe that's a place where you hear weird bells. Maybe there's a trickster spirit around Did you there. just think of this because of the bell? Yes. <laughs> what a weird i've never heard of that what a weird it's like a camel centaur siren yeah pretty much yeah that's cool i mean i mary bell i instantly think halfling oh like a little halfling village oh that could be too or gnome you know every time something has a cute name it's just like well the halfling gnomes in this area there's a lot of gnomes so yeah yeah it could just be a little gnome settlement too that makes sense and there's supposedly because there was a big wood cutting business in Gildenglade, there is some sort of fort somewhere around here it's not shown on the map but somewhere so maybe between marybelle it's like on the edge of the forest <laughs> even on the new map there's no forest there i know i know <laughs> like they're just like there's there's trees we bothered to put trees everywhere else, but just not here. Not here. Okay, the next one has the most, it's right north of Marybelle, connected by the road. It has the most innocuous name ever, Regalia. <laughs> There's nothing? What is Regalia? <laughs> we can't do towns for all of this. We, we talked about this before. In Lord of the Rings, sometimes they name like statues. Sometimes, let's think, Regalia. Maybe it's beautiful the issue with this though is that like when we were talking about what is it sword whatever creek sword state creek yeah sword state creek like these have roads connecting them is the thing it's like yes we, we the halflings of mary bell have built this small road that we uh don't travel because if you go to regalia there is it's called that because the only people that live there are helmed horrors that's why we called it regalia because this is the former regalia of a fallen army and it's like well then why the heck do you have a road go in there halflings and they're like well because why not yeah maybe instead of it being a cursed place it could be like you turn right on regalia to make your way to the next place like you know it could be more of a point of interest i guess that's also a road map but okay regalia could be like a caravan stopover it's like near the main road it's like right yeah right off the main road it, that's where you stop because there's no other real place and it's quite a long road maybe you stop over at regalia uh, off the main road and gather your supplies you could rest there like it's a large area for caravans to stop and there's like a little market there and that's why it's called regalia yeah, it could just be built next to the former large statue of a long lost keep or something. Called it regalia because the statue's wearing nice regalia. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there you go. Some little some little guy runs, uh, you know, kind of like an inn at the crossroads deal. He sells uh, the finest regalia in Termish, and it's actually just like garbage this guy makes. Perfect. That works. Next up is Illawood, which is connected by Nonthal on a road. This could be a forest, or it could be... Um... Yeah. Yeah, it could be a forest or it could be a lumber yard, like a place where people like another place to like gather from the forests that are apparently there. Yeah, it could be forest. It says wood in it. It could also be elf. It has wood in the name. It could also maybe be a little Emerald Enclave alcove. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Maybe this is a little campsite for Emerald Enclaves. You know, they've got a little setup here. And a little Emerald Enclave post that is kind of smack dab in the middle of Termish for them to do dealings and kind of, yeah, keep everything in order. Yeah, I mean, they do so much in the country, it makes sense, the positioning and stuff of it. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. So Daunt Shield, which is right north of Illawood, has a little bit of lore. It was destroyed by raiding orcs from the mountains to the north, but it was rebuilt. And it says that there is a temple of Sylvanus there. Small town built in ruins. Maybe it once was something beautiful full but now it's built amongst the ruins of a once great town or huh. sylvanus is from greek also so well roman oh yeah did and not know that. also 5e yeah neither did i he was the titulary god of the woods which is exactly what he is in 5e and 4e and 3e he's a he's a greater deity so like he's important mm -hmm. yeah sylvanus is huge in termish in this whole area this is the thing about the emerald enclave and sylvanus and all that stuff in the volcano is he's true neutral so like he doesn't give a shit what you do as long as it's in service of nature so like if it's in service of nature to let a volcano erupt and kill fifty thousand elves he's down there's no there's no good or evil to him there's just preserve nature yeah and they were preserving nature it's the nature to erupt so yeah that makes sense and this is this is why my favorite deities are neutral deities because they're just so interesting i don't want to say like single-minded but I just like this idea that like him and by extension, I imagine a lot of his followers are just no good or bad. There's just the tenants. 
And it doesn't matter how you uphold those tenants as long as you uphold them. And I think that's really interesting. I think it can create for a lot of like moral gray area. Well, huge moral gray area. A bunch of people died in the volcano. Yeah, yeah I mean, of course. <laughs> that's big. This is, you know, ruined city. There's a temple. A lot of stuff you could do there. Either people are trying to rebuild the temple, but they keep getting harassed and you got to help them out. Or maybe some cultists have come to the temple to try and do something funky and the Emerald Enclave are like, hey, maybe you could help us out with that. It's supposed to be a temple to Sylvanas, but some uh, war locks are there trying to resummon an elder evil using the old holy artifacts that were there can you help us out right yeah or you could i could see it too city destroyed uh destroyed by orcs but the temple was rebuilt by some emerald enclave people to sylvanas and then someone comes along later in 5e and is like oh there's this ruined city here it has a history we should rebuild here and sylvanas and the emerald enclave actually don't want more development in the area um so even though they have the temple they they start to like mess with this person whoever they are if you're helping them mess with their uh plan to rebuild here yeah that could work too and it's definitely, if it has a temple, then it's definitely whatever you're doing there is revolving around this temple. Yeah, exactly. It's it's the one thing you can hold on to. <laughs> Next up, kind of south of Daunt Shield, uh, connected on a road from Illawood, is Horngar. No lore. It has a very orcish name. Yeah, I mean, an orcs destroyed the place right next to it. Yeah, so I'm thinking maybe an old orc fortress, because like the orcs were run off of the main city of Termish, but maybe it was like an old dork for- fortress that they've kept. And like, yeah, it's, it's now a bed and breakfast or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, judging by the language used, it's definitely some kind of monstrous race or something going on there. Past or current, I don't know. Yeah, I think it'd be cool though, like kind of a ruined or like a, a forgotten or settlement that then is like repurposed. I think that would have a cool aesthetic to it. Yeah, maybe they destroyed Daunt Shield and then everyone else were like, yep, okay, we are not dealing with this anymore. Let's go run them out of Korngar. Yeah, going south again to Banathar. This is uh, connected by Miriabel on that smuggler's road. Um... Banathar has a temple of Sylvanas in it. That's all I know about it. No, sorry. It has a temple of Talos in it. There's a, a famous giant from the myth of Hercules that's from the southern areas of like what we think now to be Morocco or Lebanon. So I was thinking maybe this is like Banathar is with Talos and everything is some sort of Goliath or like giant town. Yeah, I could see that. Giants don't really like towns is the thing. They tend to like living in isolation. But I mean, they're right next to a mountain range and the mountain range already has so much going on in it. Why the heck not throw a giant Mm -hmm. in there? And we talked about Talos. Was it last episode? The one before? I mean, he's chaotic evil. Yeah, chaotic evil, storm lord. So they've got a temple to a chaotic evil god of destruction, mostly at sea. So it's kind of weird that they're so far inland. Like, it's not 100% at sea, but like most of his worshippers, you know, it's like Thor, right? Maybe um, the town to incorporate the giant thing and the Talos thing. Maybe there's a storm giant who lives in the mountains near there. Because like looking at the map, it's pretty close to the mountain range. Maybe there's a storm giant living in the mountains and he... uh you know he's like the de facto ruler of the town yeah they leave offerings for him as if they're leaving offerings for talos and there's kind of this praise of of the storm giant nearby yeah that'd be pretty cool next up olver's lance temple of sylvanas is there it's a it's a small town i like to think of it as having like a large rock like a sharp rock or something sticking out from it and that's like the lance is like the namesake that makes sense yeah that makes sense or some uh large you know petrified tree shaped kind of like a lance that acts as the temple mm. of salon yeah that could be great over's lance just small town nothing nothing really happening there it's off the main road and then finally the five lions it's on a mountain range i'm thinking it could be either that the mountains look like five lions you know how you kind of have the like you name a mountain because it looks like something yeah 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 like it looks like five lion heads sticking out i think they either that or it could be a sphinx a manticore griffin all these like mystical creatures that have lion bodies or lion areas about them what do you think i mean i think either way it depends on what you're going for right if you want this to be a stopover town it's just a tourist attraction there's a rock shaped like five lions and there's some you know once again snake oil salesman getting people to come look at it and go oh wow cool or we could you could pull something like uh banathar and maybe there's a sphinx that kind of is like the patron of the town well i do think it's a town though it's it's just called the five lions I think it's like it is a is a notable place. There's a road to it, but it's way it's not connected to anything. So I feel like it's like a stopover more than anything. It's nothing saying it's not a town though. True, true. Yeah, I mean it could be a place with a griffin nest. Yeah, a griffin nest. Manticores, I don't know if they live in mountains. I'd have to look. I'm not sure off the top of my head. But that could be why there's a road there. You know, the griffins are constantly taking people's shit, so they keep having to go back to the griffin nest and get their shit back. (laughs) 
Okay, like, oh, damn it, the Griffins again. I just bought that goat. <laughs> I just I want my goat back. Give me back Griffin. They'd be like, think of like a pigeon Griffin, and they'd be like, ah, dang it. <laughs> going yeah, through right. Trash. Cool. We did some good work. <laughs> let's let's go to some areas that have lore, so we don't have to work so hard anymore. Finally, we're gonna do Ravilar's Cloak, which is north near the mountains of Alorum, near Daunt Shield. It's not connected by a road, but Antonio Ravilar was a ranger who earned his namesake by protecting the village from bugbears and lawlessness during its infancy. Since his death more than 100 years ago, Ravilar's Cloak has become a rough and tumble town filled with lawless, ruthless men. The Cloak, as it is popularly referred to, is a favorite haunt for miners searching for wealth in the nearby Austrian mountains. Two taverns, the Dog and bone and the griffin are the life of the town ravliar's cloak is patrolled by the factors an independent group of warriors who try to keep the murderers to a minimum while lining their own pockets with bribes and protection money of course the factors have their own rivals as well and this situation has led to armed confrontations on the streets of the cloak have you ever seen yojimbo no Sounds like Yojimbo. Have you ever seen the Pokemon episode where there's the Electabuzz? <laughs> I'm sure I have when I was a kid. Okay, it's that's based off Yojimbo. Pretty much what happens in Yojimbo is a ronin traveling samurai goes into a town and two gangs are fighting each other and like are running gambling rings and prostitution rings and they're fighting each other for control of the town. And the ronin offers his services to both so that he can get them to kill each other. Smart. It sounds a lot like whatever that place was last uh, episode Jonathan's jump yeah yeah very close but it feels like a western down on this luck mining town ruthless men walking around like it feels very western yeah it does it uh, seems very um like Clint Eastwood yeah, very Clint Eastwood, which um, Yojimbo was remade into a Clint Eastwood movie. Oh, yeah, of course it was. It sounds exactly like, you know, The Man With No Name. Yeah, Fistful of Dollars. Good movie all around. Both of them good movies. You could run one of those. You could just literally straight up take the script like Clint Eastwood took from the Japanese. Yeah, classic city. Someone, you know, deal with this. You play both sides. I mean, it'd be up to your players if they play both sides or not. Yeah, they could play whatever side they want. You know, maybe you've got a, once again, like Jathrin's Jump. Maybe you've got a connection there. Maybe it's just a stopover that kind of sucks. Like in terms of like if your if your quest was taking you to the mountain range and the only place for you to get rest before going into the mountains is you know, Ravliar the cloak then uh, you know maybe you just go there and have a real bad time. It also seems like a good because it's so out of the way and so lawless. It seems like a good place to go if you're on the run from the law if you've done something. That too, good place to have like a Zentarum connect or something. Mm, yeah, great place for that. These battles between factors have led to the disappearance of an awful lot of money over the years. This situation, in turn, has led to an awful lot of speculation regarding where the money has disappeared to. One such story revolves around the flying helm, <laughs> a magical helmet said to infuse with the souls of dead warriors, serving as a normal helm until its owner's death. This magical item flies around the streets of Ravelier's cloak, seeking dropped coppers. Locals firmly believe that the helm can pick up small, unattended things. First guess when something goes missing in my house is not that damn helmet <laughs> Yo, that's such a funny <laughs> bit of lore a flying helmet what why would a flying helmet steal money what what's it gonna use it for <laughs> i know maybe the, the previous maybe the previous owner was just some greedy guy who collected money true yeah and now the helm's like all i knew in life was picking up coins oh maybe he was he would go through because it's like a warrior would go through battlefields and take people's coppers from their dead bodies in the battlefield yeah i mean now with this wealth going missing and stuff i would say some prospector guy highfalutin funds people that goes on prospecting into the mountain like it says people here a bunch of his wealth goes missing and he's like i don't know if it was the men i hired to do my uh, labor work or i don't know if it was one of the factions either way i can't trust anyone in this town you outsiders figure out who stole my money you know and then you have to come back to him and be like yeah it was actually this like magic helmet right and he's <laughs> it was just taking it all up he's like what the hell you mean magic helmet <laughs> As long as the mines northwest of the city continue to thrive, the city of Ravelar's cloak will continue to prosper. Despite the lawlessness and violence, the promise of gold continues to draw treasure seekers all around Vilon. So egg on our face from last week, we were like, oh, what's this gold thing? And I was like, oh, I don't really see any gold in Vilon. Nah, there's a bunch of gold there. <laughs> there's there's a whole bunch of gold. I'm sorry. <laughs> what were we what were we talking about with gold? I don't remember. It was Centaur's Bridge, I think it was. One of the 
one of the areas that was just like, oh, yeah. well, people just keep coming for that gold. And we were like, what gold? And we couldn't figure it out. But nah, it's there's gold. There's gold in every hill I mean, here. that's that's how reading lore works. You know, you go, you read one paragraph and then you read the next. You read one whole page of lore. You play your session. And then you're like, okay, I'm ready for next session. You read the next lore. And the lore is like, yeah, so everything we just said is irrelevant because a uh, fucking volcano erupted the next day. And you're like, well, shit, I already used this lore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm trying to get better at reading the entirety of the lore before I yeah before I move on or they'll reference a bunch of stuff without telling you about it and then way you'll explain it away yourself and then you know like three chapters later they explain it and it's like you know this could have been good if you're gonna reference something you could have explained it right away right yeah exactly <laughs> even in like a footnote or anything <laughs> yeah it does that a lot where it just kind of references and you're like oh, we're not gonna talk about it. okay yeah so far we haven't really had any any side quests you've run around here just from before we move on from this i mean like i was just saying prospector guy hired a bunch of people he's getting you know screwed out of his money he doesn't know if it's from one of the factions the two factions or if it's from the people he hired so he hires you to investigate it because he can't hire any of his men he doesn't trust them anymore or you could pull another one where maybe someone has come in and taken over the mine and the whole town is in upheaval about it and not you know someone's like strong-armed their way into the mine maybe one of those dragons and the whole cloak is all pissed off about this because the wealth has dried up right yeah maybe they dig too deep into the gold mines and unearth you know a shadow dragon from the un the sh the underdark we can bring it back it, it said there's a tavern in the place called the griffin maybe there is griffins in that five lions maybe the griffins are seeing shiny things and like taking from um true like from the the carts and stuff that are coming from the mine and so when they're transporting from the mine the griffins keep just snatching the shiny things so you get hired to go deal with the griffins i will say too i didn't cover it and it didn't, didn't get covered in lore but ravelar's cloak is on the mountains of alorum and all around this area the mountains of alorum and to the south uh we heard there's a lot of dwargers there's a lot of under uh under dark dwarves here in this whole area like they're also in the Alorian mountains so yeah anything dwarger related will will get you far here do dwargers care about gold i don't know i mean they were a bunch of dwarves who were enslaved by mind flayers and turned into the duergar duergar yeah and is it duergar uh, I, I say dwarger because like that that's the like nordic zombie and i was just um like it's that. either duergar or dwergar uh i always forget which one it actually is i think it might be duergar they were enslaved by mind flayers turned into the duergar and then the same story that happens every single time the mind flayers enslave a race and turn them into something different they rose up killed their mind flayer masters because the mind flayers are like no one can ever rise up and kill us even though that literally happens every single time we do this and we learn nothing from it because we're big brain intelligent people and then they were their own new race so they're kind of I, as far as i'm aware they're not very coherent with each other i know they can i know they can make themselves like really big and i think there are duragar cities and like they're still they're not idiots like, they're not mindless. They're just, like, evil. The mind flayers turn them evil. And I know they can grow right. real yeah, big. they don't have, like, plans or goals. and Like, on, on, like, on, on command? Or do they grow real big, like, over time? They have innate enlarge spell. Oh, okay. Oh, cool, cool. They can also go invisible, so they can get really large and then disappear. But they must care about gold. Like, they're, they're still intelligent creatures, right? Just because the mind flayers made them evil as fuck doesn't mean they, uh... They're essentially the drow equivalent to dwarves, right? So they must, uh... They must care right. about gold. Everyone cares about gold. Yeah, so maybe there's a fight over that, too. You have to bring the two fighting factions together to, to fight the dwarger threat. Yeah, that makes sense. Maybe, uh, you know, it was like that classic guys were mining the ore one way, and the Durgar mining the ore the other way. The wall falls down, and you You've got a Dwergar on one side and uh, the cloak person on the other side, both like awkwardly holding their pickaxes, being like, what? Right. Like mining from both sides. And eventually, eventually they hit each other and they were like, well, this is mine. And then the Dwergar are like, no, this is mine. Yeah, we'll talk more about Dwergers next next week. There's a lot going on with Dwergers. Also a good place to to work on uh, if you're going to do some Alorum lore. Let's finish off today's episode with Yorn, a place that I've been excited for for a while. Located at the edge of the Halandar Valley, Yorn serves as the garden spot for the non-human population, especially elves. The city has been nicknamed Koloran's Cradle and Lifeblood Falls by the residents. Corlan? Oh, who's Corlan? Corlan is the uh, main elven deity. He was kicked out of the actual Faron Pantheon at one point in time. Why? I don't know. He did some shit. They're like, we we don't want you in our club anymore. <laughs> You're not yeah, exactly. cool anymore. <laughs> 
Exactly. The elves still worship him, though. That uh, yeah, makes sense. The city has been named... Drows hate him. Just because he's elf. Yeah. Well, they like Lolf. There was like a big conflict between Coralon and, I don't know, some elves that didn't like him and Lolf, and I don't remember all of it, and that's what created the drow. He cursed them or something. Oh. The city has been nicknamed Coralon's Cradle and Lifeblood Falls by the residents. Yorn has an unusual effect on elves and gnomes, increasing their fertility oh. rate. <laughs> Children are born here at a rate two to three times the norm for their race. One must live in the area for five years before the fertility effect begins to show. So five years and they're dangerously fertile. <laughs> Yo, that's so random. <laughs> it's so weird. That's, what is this piece of lore? <laughs> it's like the, your sperm count goes so high when you live in this place. It's just fuck city. It's well, the, but it's not even like your sex drive goes up. It's just you're you're so fertile. Yeah. Someone looks at yeah. you and you have a baby. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, that's so random. Yeah, I I know elf children is a big deal. Yeah, like elves don't have many children at all. So elf children are like a really big deal. And when they have kids, it's a really big deal because they reproduce so slowly and so rarely. I guess that's why it's a big deal. I don't really understand why. Does it say why? No. Okay. But before we get move on to this, from this, let me get my conspiracy board here. There was a hundred residents from Gildenglade that survived. They would probably have retreated to Yorn, the nearest city. In Yorn, all they have to do is live there five years before they just start pumping out babies. So the hundred of Gildenglade might be up to like a couple thousand now that can go back to Gildenglade because of their dangerous fertility true true true, true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah why 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 is this a thing i also don't understand why it applies to gnomes yeah and why not dwarves and halflings what's the like i don't i don't see the con yeah, exactly i don't see the connection between the elves and the gnomes here i don't get it Coralon's not a gnomish god there's um something else too some elves are born with something called Coralon's blessing mm -hmm. and they can uh change gender and uh sex at will essentially cool so they could just go to this town, you know, do a little switcheroo and uh, and drow hate. <laughs> drow hate any elf with Coralon's blessing because of how they're so uh, separated by a, you know, a matriarchy. Right, right. They don't they don't like the idea that someday an elf can just be like, yep, no nope, part of the ruling class now. Right, yeah, that messes up their whole gendered. Rule. Long story short, drow are just transphobic. <laughs> <laughs> long story short there <laughs> oh no that's the constant struggle if you're a trans goth is do you be a drow or not huh <laughs> you go i got kicked out because i was born with Coraline's blessing and they all hated me for it I had to leave yeah there you go perfect yeah that's such that's so weird i, I don't i don't even know what to do with that <laughs> <laughs> that's so i i, I don't know what this is too weird <laughs> Other than it's like what? Other than this unusual property, Yorn serves as a primary stopping point along the Halondar, the road that connects Halondeth to the south and Elagon to the north. It is populated primarily by craftsmen and merchants. And kids. And yes, yeah, so many kids. <laughs> you know how many kids I would step foot in this town and I'd be like, let's leave. <laughs> I'd be like, I'm tired of all these kids. Especially like elf children live a hundred years. Elf children elves age slowly. Oh, there's what if there's a huge elf nursery here they have to stay there until they hit 50 or like you find some uh you know you go to this town you find some quest giver and you're like you describe them and you're like iridescently beautiful long blonde hair that shimmers in the sunlight he steps up to you this high elf of exquisite presence and you know you start doing all these quests for this guy this high elf he's beautiful and amazing and cool and you're all like oh yeah sexy husband elf man and you're doing all these quests for him and you, you start to notice after like your third quest and these are like small quests you know you start to notice by your third quest you're like these are kind of petty this man told us that like the fate of the city was beholden to these quests but he couldn't tell anyone because if the city found out it would go into chaos which is why he's hired outsiders really all we're doing is like stealing cupcakes from madame doreen down the street what's going on here and then on like your third quest he's in the middle of giving you the quest and like he you know five foot seven for all intents and purposes an adult man and then all of a sudden this other elf woman comes out grabs him by the ear and go, you know and is like what are you doing why are you talking to my son he is a child and we're like wait what and she's like he is only 72 you should not be listening to this child have you been giving him sweets really you stole that man's gold you went into a dungeon for this child what are you doing this is child abuse and she's like you have to get back to the daycare now and he's like starts crying and stuff and all of a sudden sexy husband turned out to be like, you know in elf age like 13 <laughs> 
And then you get chastised by mom and dad, you know, and mom makes you give back all your treasure. And she's like, he keeps doing this to adventurers. It wouldn't work if you have an elf in your party because they can spot child elves. But if you don't have an elf in your party, it'd be perfect. Very good. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> it's so fun. It's so funny that they're not adults until it's 100. It's such a weird concept. You can mess with people. Yeah, and also if you have an elf in your party or you have an elf character, good place to retire if you want to have a family, you know? <laughs> I guess so. So in 4E, it stated that many Eladrin who once dwelled in Yorn have migrated to Myth Draenor. The remaining population is split between elves, half-elves, and gnomes. A small community of kobolds, once bitter rivals from Ostrid Mountains, have settled peacefully in Yorn in the neighborhood known as Kobold Town. Kobold Town. So that's fun. Kobold Town. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. They let the kobolds hang out with them and live with them. The kobolds don't get dangerously fertile there, but... I think kobolds are already dangerously fertile. All right, right. Kobolds can also uh, change their genitalia. It takes them about a week. I did not know that. That's great. If there's not enough, yeah, if too many of one die fighting adventurers, or if too many of one just die or get lost, they can just be like, yep, okay, half of you change what's in your pants. I mean, yeah, I mean, you need to keep the kobold going. You need lots and lots of offspring to praise the big lizards that you all love, the big dragos. Also, Myth, Myth Janor, I forget the, there's, oh, I forget the whole thing of Myth Janor, but it's gone in 5e. It's, it's, no, it might be back, but it's not what it used to be. There was a big, oh yeah, Myth Janor. There was a big, uh, whole like war or something. I know it's really, it's easy to access the Feywild from Myth Janor. And there was this big battle that happened there because it used to be called Cormanthar. And I forget exactly what happened, but uh, what's his name? In our game, I gave him a really funny Irish accent where he kind of talked really fast like Popeye also. Oh, Elminster? Yeah, Elminster. He is uh, known as the hero of Mithranor. Oh, I did not know that. Because there was like this this huge war happened there. I forget exactly what happened, but like either those Eladrin from this town. The Weeping War. Either the Eladrin went back there because it was being rebuilt or the Eladrin went back there to fight the war or the Eladrin went back there and then a war started and they died <laughs> okay so here i'm reading up real quick because we brought it up for hundreds of years after the weeping war which was a war in uh, 715 myth Janor languished as a fiend infested ruins after hundreds of years the city was reclaimed by the elves of evermit in the late 14th century dr so late 14th century would be 30 and it enjoyed a century-long renaissance before falling to ruin once more the rise and fall it's always up and down with these people yeah it's a very volatile tile area from what i've gathered like it's just constantly yeah it's it's a place that like because it, it, it's it sounds like it was a place where everyone lived and it's like a kind of center of culture it sounds almost like they're doing a bit of a like a constantinople or like uh i don't want to say it but like a jerusalem they're doing like kind of like this like this ancient city full of lore that people fight over or like continuously want to rebuild but just isn't isn't happening yeah, I think it also, though, whatever between the planes is, like, thin there. Like, I think that's why there's a ladder and shit there. Like, I think it's uh, the gates between the planes are thin there or something. Yeah, well, the 4E just throws many a Ladrin who once dwelled in Yorn. We never once heard about Ladrin in Yorn before 4E, so yeah. it's like, I don't right. know, I've just decided there's a Ladrin there now. <laughs> right. Yorn is a funny place. What kind of character would be from Yorn if you're going to make a character from Yorn? Maybe like you're an elf that, uh, you know, people travel to Yorn because they're like, oh, elven babies are so rare. I don't know if elven babies are rare because they don't have them much because they take so long to grow or if, you know, like harvesting an adult elf takes 100 years, right? Pardon my harvesting? farming lingo harvesting? for elves. <laughs> um, <laughs> it takes so long to grow a new elf, right? I don't know if they don't have many children because of that or if elves are inherently not very fertile. I'm unsure. I just know that it's a really big deal when elves have kids and they really believe in the whole it takes a village to raise a child mantra. Right. So maybe you were an elf that were was expected to have kids. Mm -hmm. Like your parents were just really bickering and really driving home that you got to have kids and you just hate that until you leave. You hate kids. You hate the idea of having kids. You hate the being around <laughs> kids. You're just a child hating elf who left home because if you stayed there, you would have to have a kid. And also, you really like fuck. <laughs> you don't want to get people and pregnant. <laughs> because you really like fuck, but you hate kids. Yeah, you can't stay there because you can't just stay there and be like, no, mom and dad. Because of the fact that you like fuck, you're definitely going to end up having a kid if you stay Maybe there. Maybe you're, you, you're a character that has been like invited. You're an elf that 
that has been invited to a different place, a different elven city, and like gotten like the mail or like the message of it of like you are invited to come to our elven city because we need more elves, like we need more children. So you're kind of like a sought after person because of your crazy fertility. <laughs> like, please come join us in our town, and that's why you're going on your adventure. <laughs> Does it leave when you go, though, the fertility? It says one must live in the area for five years before their chil- their fertility effect begins to show, but it doesn't say that it decreases. Hmm, maybe. So maybe once you get it, you just continue to be very fertile. Maybe, okay, maybe you're like a 600-year-old elf or a 600 to 500-year-old gnome. You're a grandma, and you're just so sick of kids. You had 10 kids of your own, and then your 10 kids had 10 kids. Kids, and you're just sick of this you're like i'm a grandma and there's just kids everywhere i'm supposed to be proud of them i have a hundred grand do you know what it's like to have a hundred grandchildren who are children for a hundred years do you know what that is like i would much rather fight this ancient red dragon right now with my sword than have to change another diaper <laughs> i mean i fair <laughs> if you make me bake you if you make me bake you muffins which by the way i am the greatest at baking muffins you bake a lot of muffins when your children live for a hundred years and you have a hundred grandchildren but if i have to bake one more goddamn fucking muffin i will stab you myself <laughs> <laughs> Also, there you go. You can play grandma. I love grandma, and I want more grandma adventures in 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 or any sort of old people adventures. I love that trope. Or you could be a nice grandma and not do what I just did and be a bitter, upset grandma who's sick of being a grandma. You could be the nice grandma who left home and you know now you just treat your adventuring party like they're your grandkids. Or maybe you, because you're a grandma from Yorn, you have so many grandkids throughout the world that you're just going to see your like a hundred grandkids. <laughs> You're like, oh, yes, we do have to stop by Athkatla. Why? Well, I have three grandchildren there. <laughs> you just have three grandchildren <laughs> in the other town. It's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I do have a thousand of them. Also, great place if you want to have like a quirky kobold who is down with society and not like, you know. Oh, yeah, they got a kobold town. They have a kobold town, yeah. So you could be a little kobold who's like, oh, yeah, no, elves are like treated as like lesser citizens or like paid us to like clean their houses. But like, they're cool with us. They let us hang out in the town. The gnomes were like nice and gave us pie. Like, yeah, everyone should be okay with us. And then you leave Yorn and you're like, oh, no, not so good. Everyone else keeps telling me to build sewers. <laughs> I'm not a sewer builder. I'm an adventurer. Do they build sewers? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Interesting. Cities contract cobalts to build their sewers quite often because they're such good at building, uh, so good at building tunnels. Oh, that's, in- I like that a lot. Oh. <laughs> D&D infrastructure. That's something that I haven't thought too much about. Sometimes they'll build secret places and just continue living under the cities, unbeknownst to everyone else. Or sometimes the contract will be, yes, you can build a little cobalt home amongst our sewers in exchange for building our sewers. Just don't come above ground. But yeah, they have a whole little neighborhood here, so maybe they did build, build some sewers. But they have they have their own neighborhood. Uh, I like it. Good old good kobolds. They're they're good little peeps. It's a weird place. It's a very weird place. I just love that there's no no explanation yeah. why the fertility rate goes up. Yeah, there's nothing. There's not like some magical event or like you know what? I'm gonna pitch this. I'm gonna just like what if this was where Coralon lost their virginity? <laughs> I mean, maybe. <laughs> I'm I'm inclined to say that uh <laughs> I mean that could be it. Also there's they call it lifeblood falls. Maybe there's literally a waterfall there. And the waterfall, you know, maybe the waterfall is where Coralon fucked once or something. That's where Coralon courted. Didn't they just <laughs> stayed there. Gross. <laughs> 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 okay i don't know okay, i'm done with sorhan Gross. i'm done with your hun <laughs> let's move on <laughs> <laughs> uh, well adventurers that's it for our journey today uh make sure you pick your order of watch while you rest unless you have an elf in the party and they're just on watch forever on our Twitter page at DD Travelog, I'll be asking for your adventures and past campaigns in the area we covered. This week will be pretty much the entire middle of Termish. So tweet at DD Travelog or hashtag stuck in the middle, and I'll select stories to tell the top of the next episode. 
Next episode, we'll reach the first town actually on the map we're basing this podcast on. Oh, yeah. Um, Termish is there, but there's no towns shown in Termish in the 5e map. But they show Holandeth. So we'll do uh, Holandeth and the northern mountains of Orens, uh, Orensen. The 5e map actually does have Johan. The 5e was like, we need to keep these fucking elves, literally. <laughs> we, need to keep, <laughs> we need to keep the fertile elves. We can't lose this. This is too deeply a part of our culture. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Lily, for joining me. Yeah. Also, thank you for the amazing cover art. Yeah. And Blood and Dust for the theme music Around the Fire. You can find them on Bandcamp. Links in the description of the episode. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And have a great long rest. <laughs>